Good to be talking at JulieCon. I noticed the Boston area takes coding very seriously because I've been getting on and off a tea station named Assembly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the background is um, I, I was learning the Go language and the Go fans say, well, people who criticize Go have never used Go. So I decided to use it and then I'd have rights to criticize it. <laughs> so I took one of my video games and rewrote it entirely in Go Except the problem is Go doesn't tar uh, target high performance numerics. I needed a really fast discrete Fourier transform. This is a video game where the central view is a Fourier transform. Uh, so I considered writing it in Go assembler. Uh, Go has an assembler, but it's not a macro assembler. It's a very bare bones assembler. And the discrete Fourier transform, just a simple mathematical definition, would be straightforward to write an assembly, but I want to do a bunch of fancy optimizations to reduce the amount of uh, floating point calculations. So it starts to get pretty hairy. And, and in particular, I'm like pushing the vector register pressure as high as I it can go. So it's tough to keep, I have to keep very careful track of the registers. So I said use Julia to write the code for me. So this is not a compiler. It targets only three kernels of interest. I did not add any, make any sort of general purpose tool. I was after a very specific set of kernels. Uh, I tracked the, ve the vector register pressure. I did do some reference counting. I'm not going to say much more about that. I used multi methods to select the code. This is where the Julian multi -method, multiple dispatch was really handy. And then I factored out repetitiveness with uh, loops and function calls. That I could have done with that. I had a good macro assembler, but it's, I haven't seen a macro assembler that has multi methods. So just to sketch part of the operand, uh, the hierarchy, I have operands, and uh, some of the operands are in memory, some are integer registers, and some are vector registers. Uh, integer registers, the indexing was simple enough, I was willing to just keep track of that by hand, so I just, the, uh, those operands, they just have a register name. The, likewise, uh, memory locations, well, there are a couple, I have a couple different kinds of uh, types describing memory locations, I just show one here that's uh, offset plus a base register. And then you can see I have this overloaded function, asm, that given an operand kicks out the assembly code that describes that operand. So a little bit of string interpolation there. Uh, then yeah, vector registers get trickier because I wanted to uh, allocate them on the fly and have the Julia code keep track of which ones were live. So the uh, vector registers, I have a, a register number and if it's not assigned yet, it's just, it's just a symbolic operand at some point in the code. That's just a, there's a minus one as a placeholder. And then a reference count of the number of uses of it. And basically, when it gets down to zero, then the code knows to, uh, it can free it. And once again, yeah, getting the assembly, I overload my uh, uh, function to get the assembly code string for it. And if it hasn't been allocated yet, it gets one from the uh, a number out of the set of available registers. And this returns the obvious string. All right, yeah, code selection. This is the, uh, multi, where the multi methods come in handy. Uh, particularly on x86 architecture, given it's been around for so many decades, it has lots of ways to spell add. But <laughs> writing the code, particularly if I'm writing like a complex multiply, it's supposed to be polymorphic over different types. I want to spell add one way. So I spell it in Julia as ADD. And then that expands to the various opcodes depending upon the types. So here I show it uh, with a two, uh, vec two vector registers and, or three vector registers for add and subtract. And then here's a, yeah, a place where a union type came in handy. I also wanted to find add for operands that could have been in memory or integer, rep integer register or a, uh, a, a constant. So there I use the, uh, the union type and get another method called ADD. It's also what got move is like, I think I had five overloads. And I should add that this emit on the right hand side of these definitions, it has the smarts to take the three operand form and convert it to the two operand form where appropriate. All right, complex, uh, this is uh, doing with a complex value domain. Yeah, this is a video game where the output is a complex value, uh, complex plane. So it's a little unusual. Yeah, yeah. complex value is really straightforward. Um, complex value is the real and imaginary part, and those are operands, and 
then like the move a complex number, I move the two pieces, the multiply two complex operands. Well, it's a little more complicated. I don't show the code there, but I have an overload, and it calls the other overloads to add, subtract, and multiply. It all works nicely. So here's an example of a piece of the code that generates some of the assembly code. Uh, I'm not going to try to explain the math behind it, but it's trying to exploit a bunch of symmetries and factor out stuff like crazy. But the nice thing is, by using the Julia, the, the for loops there and the overloading, I can make a, a, a uh, it's not a compiler, it's just a, a, a super duper macro assembler. It kicks out the code. So if you want to see the code in full detail, it's on my uh, GitHub website under frequent, uh, my name and frequent invaders. The script is 344 lines of Julia. Now the generated assembly code is 243 lines. Now you say, well, gosh, why didn't I write the 243 lines by hand? Well, there's a lot of bookkeeping if you saw that uh, <laughs> the code on the right-hand side there. And partway through doing this exercise, I totally changed my mind as to how I was going to exploit the symmetries. So the Julia code was much more malleable to be able to uh, do that and also get the code right the first time and not have to debug it. Because uh, this code on the right-hand side is not pretty stuff to debug if there's a mistake in it. So I think I came out ahead. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for some questions. If anybody has questions about this? Yeah, can you know? Can you show the game? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't think I have. I think I have a. Let's see. So this is not the Go version. This is the old uh, ah. No, I can't. <laughs> but you can if you have a PC, you can download it. If you have a Mac, you have to download the GitHub version, and build it yourself. I have not yet learned the correct way to package stuff for Macs. There's another question somewhere. They all agree. Ask me at the break. I could go download it and run it. <laughs> I, I had a question. Um, yeah. how, did you get to the Go coding part? The what about you, the Go? You rewrote it in Go. Oh, yes. Yeah, so the whole thing worked. It, it's okay. on the GitHub site. You can build it. It runs. So how, what, what did you feel about the Go stuff? Um, it's a monomorphic language with no overloading, no parametric methods. Um, it's good at what they intended to do, which is large-scale systems programming as a replacement for C. If you're doing mathematical work, you don't want it, really. <laughs> Seems like the right there. Uh, okay. I guess, uh, thank you very much. Okay. Um, and it is now lunchtime. No, it's um, sponsor talks. Oh, the sponsor talks. I so I, I have to get off the that. stage. Wait, aren't you doing sponsor talks? Well? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Come back. Uh, okay. <laughs> this, time, this time, as a, as a, a representative of Intel, who has generously yeah. sponsored Julia this year um, and previously, so uh, Intel has been a great a great friend to Julia. Um, so thank you. All right. All right. I'm just going to be. Uh, yeah, this is the, the paid infomercial. I was trying to figure out what to do for this. So I asked around at work for slides. And the slide I got was for something presented at, I think, at PyCon. And you'll see here, um, yeah, here, prototyping. Do it on your workstation. There's a bunch of steps. And your favorite languages should be Python, R, or MATLAB, or Excel. And then when you get your code working, yeah, let's go put it on the cluster. And sorry, you got to do. Uh, Fortran, C++, Java. I think we know how to fix this. <laughs> so we really just got to get Julia going into production. Um, so I'm not going to show the fixed slide, because I think in our imaginations, we know how it's supposed to look. Now, there's some things to be aware of in fixing it. 
it may be, um, and the big one is parallelism because the hardware trends are that the uh, tr number of transistors on chips is still growing. And the, the, but the single thread performance is more or less topping out. The, uh, the architectures get a little better, but it's, it's, it's a little bit for bragging rights, but it's not a whole lot faster for single thread performance between now and say a decade ago. The frequencies have definitely more or less topped out. I mean, maybe somebody will come up with a five megahertz chip, but it really, the, the big run up is over. Probably some of you are probably too young to remember when chips were one megahertz and then they jumped to 10 and got up to 100 and got to a gigahertz. And it seemed like it was this free lunch. You just had to wait 18 months and your code speed doubled. Well, sorry, that's over, at least for single threaded code. Uh, we've hit a power, uh, serious problem is power. The number of transistors is growing on the chip. But the power they can, and it used to be as you cram more and more transistors in the same area, the, number, the power you acquired uh, for each transistor went down. But that's less true now. So as you cram more transistors on a chip, it means you can't turn them on all at the same time, or the chip will melt. So there's a big push toward so-called, it's called the dark silicon problem, that you can put many more transistors on the chip than you can afford to turn on. So there's much uh, push towards uh, using those transistors for very specialized purposes, like data com uh, compression, video, uh, the other part is the yeah, number of logical cores or hardware threads is, is going up. Uh, the Knight's Landing chip has, we have a 72 cores. I know that the uh, top 500 Chinese supercomputer has, what, 256 cores, about. So as far as, yeah, the impact on Julia is you need good support for SIMD because the SIMD units keep getting uh, wider and the number keep multiplying. 1999 with the Pentium 3, when the SIMD was introduced on the x86 architecture, it was four uh, point, single precision floating point operations a sec, uh, per clock. And that wasn't because it was four wide, actually. <laughs> the uh, underlying arithmetic units were only two wide, but there were two of them. So you got four, four operations per clock. Uh, Knight's Landing, gosh, they're now 16 wide. There's two of the units. Each unit does multiply adds. So, so it's 64 uh, single precision operations per clock on a single core. So taking advantage of SIMD is important. Uh, the at SIMD, which I contributed to Julia, is a good start. The more it could be done, there's also uh, help with uh, putting together a uh, SIMD support for explicit uh, SIMD types. And that should go somewhere. And finally, mapping the, there's a natural mapping from F90, what I call F90 style programming, a vectorized, as it's sometimes called in the Julian community, as opposed to, I'm used to vectorized, means what it means in Fortran and code generation. But this vectorized style, mapping to SIMD, there's a natural mapping, but it, it probably still needs some work in the Julia compilers. All right, threading, number of hardware threads per socket keeps growing. So we need better threading. Uh, P threads is just way too low level model. It's actually, it's a terrible model now. And unfortunately it's stuck. And a lot of people who grew up on P threads assume that's the only way things can work. The, uh, for example, in P threads you have to specify the stack size. We don't, if you don't specify a big enough stack, your code crashes. The, uh, you really shouldn't have to do that, particularly for the class of users that Julia is targeting. And particularly if you're calling code that's in a black box, you have no idea how big the stack's supposed to be. Uh, also, yeah, binding stacks to threads is a big, bad thing. Saying that each thread has one stack and the thread is locked to that stack, that's just very bad news for scalability. Every modern scalable system has gotten away from that. Silk's gotten away from that. OpenMP with it, even OpenMP with its untied tasks has gotten away from that. Go has definitely completely divorced itself from that. So just think about that when designing threading systems. Okay, composability is important. You have to, if various black boxes, you're composing them and uh, calling one black box from another black box, they each have internal threading. You want that to run efficiently. There's, this is something where OpenMP falls flat. And I would say, look, and also it has to compose with the current Julia tasking mechanism. And that's not an, e it's not an easy problem. Finally, if, yeah, if you look, want inspiration for state-of-the-art threading, I would say look at the Go runtime. They've rethought everything from scratch. Now, they've thrown out compatibility with some uh, other languages in, as part of that process. But 
the, the, I, I find it very inspiring what they've done. All right, distributed memory and heterogeneous processors. Uh, I mean, Julia has some the one side communication, whatnot. But I think you have to keep in mind you have to be really you have to be competitive with uh, the current popular approaches that are, I think, a bit more aggressive than what the current Julia implementation does. But I, I could be wrong. I haven't tried it lately. And finally, uh, heterogeneous processors, processors that have more than one kind of core on them, and different cores are good at doing different things, or maybe certain cores are very dedicated to only one area, such as machine learning. Uh, I think the, JIT, the Julia JIT environment fits very well there. We don't have to worry about, oh, we forgot to generate code for the XYZ unit. Oh, well, the JIT can go generate it on the fly for that. So I think there's a good fit there for the future heterogeneous processing. Uh, finally, for commercial customers, there's one more direction. We need some stability. We really got to get the Julia 1.0 because the changes each year scare people off. Like even the, gosh, the Julia script I wrote to generate the, the uh, JuliaCon schedule HTML, it, I found out I actually got hooked on a uh, Julia pre-0.5 feature. It doesn't work under Julia 0.4. I just accidentally walked into that. So yeah, some stability is going to be important for large-scale uh, commercial users. So thanks, it's been a lot of fun, uh, at least for me personally, because my uh, somebody a couple of years ago said, I, said, go out and find out what technical people are using for computing. I was supposed to come back with the answer, Python. And instead I said, hey, Julia, it does everything I want. <laughs> <laughs> and this is my last talk for Intel. I'm retiring on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Questions or yes? Do you plan to continue to be active in the Julia community post-retirement? I don't know. Uh, my new employer, they asked me to do high performance C, which is what I used to do uh, before joining Intel. And I'm thinking of asking them, well, do you want to hear talk about Julia? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, no, 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 the cores, uh, lots of applications can use those cores. You just have to write the code the right way a and have runtimes that have the, uh, or the, the underlying, the way the, the code is uh, executed needs to be able to uh, use those cores efficiently. And my point was the pthreads model just doesn't cut it for that. Um, but like Guy, Guy Steele was talking about earlier, how uh, implicit parallelism. Uh, and so he was talking about like recursive parallelism. You can easily generate a million tasks uh, without too, too much effort, actually. And if you just make every black box as parallel as possible and make them composable, then the system can grab as much parallelism as there is, uh, hardware parallelism as there is available.